Chapter Fifteen of *The Convict* by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen. What a whimsical thing is that strange composition, man! The very elements of his nature war against each other, though bound together by hoops of steel. The spirit and the body are continually at variance, and the activity of the one often renders the other inert. Eda Brandon could not sleep after Edgar Adelon left her. Her imagination, ever busy, presented to her continually scenes the most fearful and the most terrible, where the gibbet and the axe and the deadly shot were seen and heard, and her uncle's form appeared as a criminal, freed for an hour or two from dark imprisonment, to endure the torture of a public trial. She judged of all she knew as a woman judges, with keen foresight and penetration, but without sufficient experience to make that penetration available. But still her fancy was busy, and it kept her waking. For more than one hour she did not sleep, but still she tried hard to do so, for she proposed to rise early on the following morning, when she knew that those whom she had determined to consult as to all the questions before her would be up but such resolutions are vain fatigue and exhaustion imperatively counselled repose and at length when her eyes closed notwithstanding all her determinations to watch she went on in a profound slumber for more than one hour after her usual time of rising a morning of hurry and anxiety succeeded dudley had already gone out with the gamekeepers and edgar to shoot lord hadley was still in bed mr filmer had been summoned to a dying man at daybreak sir arthur ate his breakfast absorbed in journals and papers and eda though she loved him had still doubts and hesitations which prevented her from speaking to her uncle on the subject predominant in her thoughts at length he looked at his watch and rose suddenly saying i must leave you dear eda it is strange that mr norris has not arrived as i expected him on business no mention was made of the peculiar influence that the one party possessed over the other and the tone too was so commonplace that eda began to imagine she had been over penetrating and had imagined things that did not exist so that she saw her uncle depart with comparative tranquillity and remained alone for near an hour trying to occupy herself with the ordinary amusements of the morning at the end of that time however her maid opened the door of her own little sitting-room saying miss clive ma'am and helen was soon seated by eda brandon what is the matter helen dear said eda as the other at her invitation sat down on the sofa beside her you look pale and agitated i am sure you are for however we may hide it dear helen and however difficult it may be to detect in line or feature the anxiety of the heart writes itself upon the face in characters faint but very distinct you are anxious about something helen something has gone amiss tell me dear helen for i think i need not say that if i can console or help you have only to tell the how to eda brandon you are ever kind to your own little helen as you used to call me in my childhood eda replied her beautiful companion you were then but a child yourself but from that day to this there has been no change and it is time that i should try to return the kindness dearest eda it is you i am anxious for at least yours and i cannot refrain from telling you what i know in the hope that you may be able to avert the danger but you must promise me first not to mention one word to any one of that which i am about to say but my dear helen how can i avert danger if i may not mention to any one the circumstances inquired eda i am a very weak powerless creature helen and as you say the danger menaces mine more than myself if i must speak of it to no one how can i warn them listen listen eda was the answer you must not indeed tell what i relate except as i point out but still you shall have room enough to warn those you love of the danger their own acts are bringing upon them do you promise eda certainly helen replied eda brandon it is for you to speak 
or be silent and i must take your intelligence on your own conditions yet i think you might trust me entirely to act for the best helen i must not said helen clive what i have to say might involve the lives of others listen then eda your uncle sir arthur is involved in schemes which will i am sure lead to his destruction he is going this very evening to a place whence he will not come back without great guilt upon his head and great danger hanging over him perhaps he may never come back at all but to be sure that if he do go peace and security are banished from him for ever persuade him not to go eda that is the only thing which can save him she spoke with eager interest and it was impossible from her look her tone her whole manner to doubt for one moment that she was fully impressed with the truth of what she said nor was eda without her anxiety all that she had seen the night before all that she had remarked of her uncle's behaviour for several days not only showed her that there was foundation for helen clive's assertion but directed her suspicions aright and though she paused it was not in any doubt but rather to consider how without deceit she could obtain further information from one who was not disposed to give it i cannot persuade him helen she said at length in a sad tone without much more intelligence than you have given he would only laugh at me nay perhaps with all that you could give such would be the same result men are often sadly obstinate and ridicule the prophetic fears of woman who sees the events in which they are called to mingle but from which she is excluded not unfrequently more justly than themselves because she is but a spectator you have neither told me the place to which he is going nor the hour nor the object no nor the inducement inducement she continued in a thoughtful tone as if speaking to herself what can be a sufficient inducement for my uncle with everything to lose and nothing to gain by such commotions to take part in any of these rash schemes i see that you have yourself had fears answered helen and that those fears have not led you far from the truth then as to the inducement eda oh yes speak of that replied miss bandon if i knew what it was perhaps i might remove it perhaps so said helen thoughtfully then paused for an instant to consider i think you can eda she continued if i know looks and can understand tones you certainly will be able but there are several inducements as i suppose there are in all things there is the vanity i believe of adhering steadily to opinions once professed how much soever the man the circumstances or the times may be changed but that would have been nothing had they not led him on from act to act and whenever he wavered whenever he thought of how much he risked upon an almost hopeless undertaking still forced him forward by fears by fears exclaimed eda of what of whom who has sir arthur adelon to fear what can he apprehend she spoke somewhat proudly and helen gazed at her with a sad but tender look while she replied in a few brief words he whom he fears is one whom if generously treated there is no cause to fear his name is dudley eda what he fears is the discovery by mr dudley of some dark transactions in the past i know not what for they did not mention it the proofs of which these men have in their possession eda sat before her silent with amazement for several moments but then she put her hand to her brow and the next moment a smile full of hope came up into her face if that be the inducement she said i think it will be easily removed dear helen but you spoke of others may they not be sufficiently strong to carry him on the same course still oh no replied helen that is the great motive take that away and he will be safe speak to mr dudley first eda and get him to say to sir arthur these words or some that are like them i have heard of some papers to be returned to me in a few days sir arthur adelon affecting questions long past but i think it right to say at once that i wish all those gone by affairs to be buried in oblivion and i pledge you my word if those papers are given to me i will destroy them without looking at them 
"'That is much to ask, Helen,' exclaimed Eda, with a look of hesitation. "'How can I tell that those papers do not affect his very dearest interests? "'I remember well that his father lost a fine property some years ago, by a suit of law. "'May not these very papers affect that transaction? "'May they not afford the means of recovering it?' "'They do not, they do not,' answered Helen eagerly. "'And if they did, would he not promise you, Eda?' The emphasis was so strong upon the word you that it brought the colour into Eda Brandon's cheek, for she found that woman's eyes had seen at once into woman's heart. Still she shrunk from owning the love that was between Dudley and herself, and she replied, I had better ask my cousin Edgar to speak to Mr. Dudley about it. Speak to him yourself, Eda, replied Helen with a faint smile. Your voice will be more powerful. "'But let me proceed, for I must be home without delay. "'When you have Mr. Dudley's promise to speak as I have said, "'then beg Sir Arthur yourself not to go this night where he is going. "'Mind not, Eda, whether he laughs or is angry, "'but do you detain him by every persuasion in your power?' "'But if he should not come home,' said Eda, "'such a thing is not impossible.' He has been out very much lately, both by day and by night, and we are all ignorant of whither he goes on such occasions. Helen once more paused before she replied, and then said with evident hesitation and fear, You must send some persons down to seek him then, dear Eda. Let them go down to a place called Meads Farm, halfway between this and Barhampton, about eight o'clock to-night. There is a large empty barn there and at it, or near it, they will find two or three men standing, who will not let them pass along the path unless they give the word, Justice. Then if they go along the road before them, towards Barhampton, they will find the person they are seeking. But, oh, I trust, Eda, he will be found before that, for then it will be almost too late. Who can I send? said Eda in a low tone, as if speaking to herself. But Helen caught the words, and replied in an imploring tone, "'Not Mr. Adelon, Eda, not your cousin. He might be led on with his father, and ruin overtake him, too.' Eda smiled sweetly, and laid her hand upon Helen Clive's, with a gentle and affectionate pressure. But, as she did so, some painful anticipations regarding the fate of her beautiful and highly gifted companion crossed her mind, and she said with a sigh, "'Do you know?' i am almost a chartist too helen helen started saying indeed i do not understand what you mean eda what i mean is dear helen replied miss brandon that i wish there were no distinctions upon earth but virtue and excellence and high qualities helen now understood her and cast down her eyes with a blush and a sigh and eda put her arm round her neck adding in time of need my helen come to me tell me all and everything and above all how i can serve you and you shall not find eda brandon wanting but hark there's lord hadley's voice in the hall below helen clive turned pale and trembled he will not come here she said eagerly do not let him come here oh how shall i get away why what is the matter asked eda in surprise but before helen could answer another voice rich and harmonious but speaking in grave and almost stern tones was heard my lord i beg your pardon but this is a matter which admits of no delay i must repeat my request for a few minutes conversation with you immediately lord hadley was then heard answering sharply and the next moment the voices ceased as if the speakers had retired into one of the rooms below you do not seem to like lord hadley helen said eda in a thoughtful tone i abhor him answered helen clive and i have cause but now i must return to the grange and i will ask you as a favour dear eda to send some one with me by the way it is very strange to feel afraid at going out alone for one who has been accustomed as i have been to roam about like a free bird without one thought of danger or annoyance but now i tremble at every step i take and watch every coming figure with apprehension. "'And has this young man done this?' asked Eda Brandon. "'It is sad, very sad. But you shall have protection, Helen.' 
Helen Clive did not reply, and Eda rang the bell, and gave orders that one of the old servants, who had been attached for twenty years to her father's house, should accompany Helen back to the Grange. Then they parted after some more brief explanations, but just as Helen reached the foot of the stairs where the servant was waiting for her, the door of the library was thrown violently open, and Lord Hadley appeared with a flushed and angry countenance. Mr. Dudley was standing two or three steps behind him, and his cheek, too, was hot and his brow frowning. Without seeing Helen, and, indeed, in the blind fury of passion without noticing any one else, the young nobleman turned before he left the library, and with a menacing gesture said to Mr. Dudley, "'Your insolence, sir, shall not go without notice. Don't suppose your rash and mercenary pretensions have escaped my eyes. Be sure they will be treated with the contempt they merit, but I will take care that they shall be pursued no farther, for they shall be exposed to Sir Arthur Adelon this very day.' Dudley took a step forward and replied with a stern look, your lordship had better take care what use you make of my name in your discourse for depend upon it if you treat it disrespectfully i shall know how to punish you for so doing it is probable that more angry words would have followed but at that moment two other persons were added to the group by the advance of mr filmer from the outer hall and by the appearance of the butler from the side of the offices carrying a tray with letters two letters for your lordship said the servant advancing in a commonplace manner as if he observed nothing of the angry discussion which was going on a letter for you sir he continued addressing dudley as soon as lord hadley had taken what he presented the young nobleman gave a hurried glance around and the slight pause which had been afforded was sufficient to allow reflection to come to his aid by this time mr filmer was speaking to helen clive and both she and the priest were moving fast towards the great doors of the house but the presence of the two servants was now enough to restrain lord hadley's impetuous temper and without opening the letters he hurried away towards his bedroom leaving dudley alone in the library the butler shut the door and retired to tell the housekeeper and some of his fellow-servants all that which he had seen and heard but which he had affected not to observe Dudley, in the meantime, laid down the letter on the table and stood in bitter thought. Although a man of strong command over himself, command gained during a long period of adversity, he was naturally of a quick and eager disposition, and a severe struggle was taking place in his bosom at that moment to maintain the ascendancy of principle over passion. No, he said at length, no, I will make one more effort to reclaim him, i will not dwell upon his insulting conduct towards me but i will point out the wickedness and the folly of the course he is pursuing and endeavour to call him back to honour and to right the very determination served to calm him and looking down upon the letter on the table he took it up saying i wonder who this can be from i do not know the hand i must see for the seal is black and opening it he found the following words dear sir we have the melancholy task of informing you of the sudden decease last night at half past nine o'clock of our much respected friend and client rev dr dudley which took place at st john's just as he was about to retire to rest although we know that you will be greatly grieved at this sad event we are forced to intrude some business upon your attention under the following circumstances about a fortnight ago our late respected client having felt some apoplectic symptoms judged it right to send for mr emerson of our firm in order to make his will which was in due form signed sealed and delivered he therein appointed you his sole executor having bequeathed all his property real and personal to yourself with the exception of a few small legacies he has also requested you to make all the arrangements for his funeral as you may think proper merely directing that it should be conducted in a plain and unostentatious manner it is therefore very necessary that you should return to cambridge as soon as possible or that you should send your directions by letter in the meantime we will take all proper steps in the matter and trust to be honoured with your confidence as we have been with your lamented relative for many years the letter was signed by a well-known law firm in cambridge 
the first emotion in the mind of edward dudley was that of deep grief grief simple and unalloyed for the loss of one whom he had truly loved but the next was a feeling of bereavement his staff was broken his support gone the only one in all the world who had acted a kindly almost a parental part to him for long long years was no more he felt as i have said bereaved for although the love of eda brandon that love which had been cherished in secret by both was a great consolation and a comfort yet it was so different both in kind and degree from the affection entertained for him by his own relation that they could not be brought at all into comparison the one with the other new attachments never wholly compensate for old ties they fill a different perhaps a larger place but they leave the others vacant he mourned sincerely then and it was some time before the thought which would have presented itself much earlier to a worldly mind came even to his memory the thought that the riches of the earth which can never compete in a generous heart with those affections which are above the earth but which influence so much the course of human life and mortal happiness were now his that he was no more the impoverished student seeking by hard labour to recover the position which his family had once maintained that he was not only independent but wealthy and though perhaps not exactly upon a par in point of fortune with the heiress of large hereditary possessions still no unportioned adventurer seeking to mend his condition with her gold he knew that his father's first cousin had himself inherited a very fair estate he knew that he had held rich benefices and lucrative offices and he also knew that though a liberal and a kindly man he had been also a very prudent one and had certainly lived far within his income thus he was certain of more than a moderate fortune and although it would be folly to deny that such a conviction was a relief to his mind still sincere grief was predominant and he felt that the wealth he had acquired by the loss of a friend could in no degree compensate for the bereavement while he thus meditated he heard a quick but heavy step upon the stairs the glass doors between the hall and the vestibule bang with a force which might almost have shaken the panes from the frame and the moment after he saw the figure of lord hadley pass the windows of the library dudley instantly took up his hat darted out and looked around but the young nobleman had disappeared and seeing one of the gamekeepers who had been out with him and edgar in the morning walking slowly away from the house he stopped him and asked which way the young nobleman had taken his manner was quick and eager and the cloud of grief was still upon his brow so that the man looked at him for a moment with some surprise before he answered he then pointed out the way and dudley was turning at once to follow it when the butler came out upon the terrace saying with a low bow miss brandon wishes to speak with you for a few moments sir if you are not otherwise engaged if the business is not of great importance said dudley i will be back in ten minutes it is nothing particular i believe sir answered the man she has just had a note from sir arthur to say he won't be back to dinner i fancy that is all then say i will wait upon her in ten minutes replied dudley i wish to catch lord hadley for a moment before he proceeds farther we have something to speak about which must be settled at once and he sped upon the way as the gamekeeper had directed it was in the direction of the grange ten minutes elapsed and dudley had not returned a quarter of an hour half an hour an hour and when he came back he was evidently a good deal excited he calmed himself down however as much as possible and immediately requested an interview with miss brandon who came down and joined him in the library remaining with him nearly till dinner-time they were at last interrupted by the priest who came in search of a book and shortly after the dressing-bell rang at the dinner-table lord hadley who appeared very late was gloomy and thoughtful he never addressed a word to mr dudley and spoke but little to eda or the priest who took one end of the table edgar adelon did not at all seek to converse with him and when any words passed between them they were as sharp as the customs of society would permit dudley was very grave and if he still took any interest in lord hadley's conduct 
he might not be altogether satisfied to see him drink so much wine as soon as eda had quitted the room however dudley rose saying that with mr filmer's permission he would retire as he was obliged to go out for a short time and after emptying two more glasses lord hadley also left the table and the party broke up the young peer took his hat in the vestibule and walked out upon the terrace asking one of the men who were in the hall if he had seen which way mr dudley took the man replied up the avenue my lord and lord hadley pursued the same path it was never to return End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen the night was dark but fine and innumerable stars spangled the sky as four men stood on watch by the side of a large old barn within sight of a farmhouse although a human habitation was there the place had a desolate and solitary aspect there was the farmstead with its ricks and stacks it is true showing that industry was at work but not another house was to be seen around except that yeoman's dwelling not a labourer's cottage even and the ground immediately around was uncultivated and presented no homely and comfortable hedgerows no protection from the bleak winds which swept over the adjacent downs immediately around the house the ground sloping hither and thither was covered with short turf upon a sandy soil which appeared in many a yellow patch and broken bank and between two of the latter ran a good broad road heavy to travel through with a wain or cart at the edge of this road and not more than twenty or thirty yards from it was the large shapeless barn i have mentioned the boarding broken off in several places and the tiling in a very shattered condition between it and the road upon the bank which was not above three feet high were seated the men who as i have stated were placed on watch there and it was evident that they listened from time to time for distant sounds breaking off their low-toned conversation and bending an attentive ear at the word hush they can't have got there yet william said one of them remember it is more than three miles ay but they will go it quick answered the other that was at the first starting replied the first their march will be slower after a while it is your impatience calculates your time and not your wit i would rather be at work with them there said another than lagging here doing nothing we have a post of more importance and perhaps of more danger too rejoined the second speaker the success of the whole may depend upon us hark there is a footstep perhaps it is the soldiers they talked of now jump down and stand to your arms my lads remember you william carry the intelligence at the first sight of them while we hold them in parley as long as possible and as he spoke he jumped down into the road first snatching up a musket that lay by his side whoever or whatever it was they expected only a single figure appeared and as it came up the sandy path towards them a voice shouted stand give the word justice replied the clear full voice of mr dudley and as he spoke he continued to advance direct towards the men who barred the road that's the word sure enough said one of them in a low tone but he has got no arms and does not look like our people i dare say he is one of sir arthur's men replied another and after a momentary hesitation they made way to let him pass dudley however paused in the midst of them inquiring in a familiar tone which way have they taken and after hearing the reply of straight on you cannot miss it he walked forward at the same rapid pace which had brought him thither for a little more than two miles farther no sound nor sight indicated that he was approaching the scene of any important event the road was varied sometimes passing over a part of the bare downs sometimes gliding in between little copses and hedgerows sometimes crossing over a shoulder of the hill sometimes skirting its base at length however a distant roar was heard as of a multitude of human beings talking tumultuously and coming out of the little valley through which passed the byway he was pursuing 
a strange and not unpicturesque scene burst upon his eyes he was now at the foot of the steep ascent which led up to the old gates of the small town of barhampton and the decayed walls with their flanking towers were seen crowning the rise at the distance of somewhat more than a quarter of a mile i have said that they were seen though the night was very dark and the moon had not yet risen but it was by a less mellow and peaceful light than that of the fair planet that the crumbling fortifications were displayed more than a hundred links were blazing with their red and smoky glare around the gate and beneath the walls and a sea of human beings moving to and fro some on horseback and some on foot was shown by the same fitful flames with strange effects of light and shade varying over them every moment as the groups themselves changed their forms or the links were carried from place to place at the same time a dull murmuring subdued roar was heard strong but not loud as of many persons speaking eagerly and every now and then a voice rose in a shout above the rest as if giving directions or commands without pausing even an instant to gaze upon the scene however strange and interesting dudley hurried on up the ascent sometimes running sometimes walking till he reached the outskirts of the mob where a number of the less zealous and energetic were standing idly by some with arms in their hands of various kinds and sorts muskets fowling pieces pikes swords scythes set upright upon poles pistols and daggers or large knives some totally unarmed like himself or furnished merely with a bludgeon in advance was the denser part of the crowd agitated vociferous swaying hither and thither and seeming to attend but little to the commands which were shouted from time to time by several persons on horseback the confusion was indescribable and little could be seen of what was going on in front though the light of the torches caught strong on one or two of the banners bearing inscriptions in gilt letters and upon the figures of the horsemen who were raised above the crowd on foot towards one of these mr dudley strove to force his way but it was with difficulty that he gained every moment or two a step in advance till at length he came suddenly in the midst of the densest mass of the people upon a brass six-pounder of somewhat antique form with the two horses which had drawn it up the hill there seemed to be another a little in advance but seeing the space somewhat clear on the other side of the gun dudley leaped over it and hurried on more freely towards the figure upon which his eyes had been fixed and which he recognised at once though some attempt had been made to disguise the person as he was passing the other field piece however a man of foreign appearance with a large pair of mustachios stopped him rudely telling him in french to keep back dudley replied in the same language i must pass sir i wish to speak with that gentleman and at the same time he thrust aside the other who was much less powerful than himself and was approaching sir arthur adelon when suddenly a broad blaze broke up just under the arch of the old gateway and a loud voice exclaimed that will soon burn them down the crowd recoiled a little and dudley for a moment caught sight of a huge pile of dry bushes which had been placed against the old gates and lighted by some gunpowder the next instant he was by sir arthur's side and then for the first time saw a little in advance of the baronet the lawyer norris apparently acting as the leader of the multitude and at that moment giving directions for bringing round the muzzles of the field pieces to bear upon the gates as soon as they should be destroyed by the flames the tumult and uproar were so great that sir arthur neither saw nor heard dudley till the latter had spoken to him three times and then when he turned his eyes upon him he started and became very pale sir arthur listen to me for a moment said dudley bend down your head and hear what i have to say the baronet seemingly by an involuntary movement did as he was required and dudley continued in a low voice saying take the first opportunity of turning your horse and riding away and be sure impossible sir impossible answered sir arthur in the same tone and be sure answered dudley without heeding his reply that if you do not you will have bitter cause to regret it listen to me yet one moment sir before you answer 
"'There is a part of the gate down,' cried the loud voice of Norris. "'Bring these cannon round quicker. Have you lost your hands and arms?' "'Sir Arthur Adelon,' continued Dudley earnestly, "'I was asked a question by those who sent me, and to it I gave a willing reply. "'In accordance with that reply, I was directed to say to you, "'I have heard that some papers will be given up to me in a few days, "'affecting questions long past. "'But I say at once, I wish all those gone-by affairs to be buried in oblivion, "'and if you will retire at once from this scene of treasonable violence,' i give you my word that when those papers are given to me i will destroy them without looking at them then he has betrayed me murmured sir arthur with a furious look towards norris he has forced me forward into these deeds and then betrayed me but it is too late he added aloud for the preceding words though they were caught by dudley had been uttered in a very low tone i know not what you speak of sir if you have come here to put forth enigmas I am too busy to unriddle them. It matters not to me whether you look at papers or not. That is all your own affair. And breaking off abruptly, he again gazed gloomily at Norris and muttered something between his teeth, of which Dudley only heard the word, Revenge. There were two holsters at his saddle-bow, which are commonly used in some of our volunteer regiments of cavalry. And as he spoke, Sir Arthur Adelon put his right hand to one of them while he turned his horse with the other but dudley grasped his bridle rein saying one word more sir arthur and then i must go you are in great danger he added in a lower voice not only are there troops within the town but in five minutes you will have the yeomanry upon you so much i have learned this day be advised for your own sake for the sake of your family turn your horse disentangle yourself from the crowd and make the best of your way back to brandon Sir Arthur gazed at him with a look of stupefied astonishment, but ere he could answer, a voice shouted, "'The gate's down! The gate's down!' and immediately a rush forward took place, beginning with those behind, who heard the announcement without seeing what was going on in front. "'Orderly! Orderly!' cried Norris. "'Let the guns advance first. But as he spoke, there was a loud ringing peal of musketry from the inner side of the gateway, and then a straggling shot or two a man amongst the rioters dropped another staggered pressing his hand upon his side and fell and the horse which norris was riding reared high and then came thundering down at the same instant there came the sound of a wild hurrah from the side of the hill to the left together with that of galloping horse another volley of shot rang from behind the gateway of the town and then with a cheer a small but compact body of infantry advanced at the charge with fixed bayonets from within the walls two more of the rioters had fallen by the second discharge the cry spread among them that the cavalry were upon them those at the extreme verge of the crowd began to run the centre remained firm for a moment more from indecision than courage but the next instant panic seized all and one general scene of flight and confusion followed Dudley caught one more glance of Sir Arthur Adelon, but it was only to see that he was spurring the fine horse he rode fiercely along the slope towards the other side from that which now presented the advancing line of a well-disciplined body of yeomanry cavalry. It was now time that Dudley should think of his own safety. He was in the midst of a body of rioters, whose acts amounted to treason, though a more lenient construction was afterwards put upon them, under the merciful influence of modern civilization with quick step then but not at a run he turned somewhat in the direction which had been taken by sir arthur adelon skirted round the town to the westward and when he had got in amongst some houses which had been built upon the walls turned back as if coming towards the scene of a fray the great mass of the people had fled down the hill towards the villages and copses in the interior and it must be said that the yeomanry inexperienced in such proceedings made but few prisoners considering the number of people present at the attack upon the town a confused noise however reached dudley's ears of galloping horse and shouts and cries but keeping away to the right he avoided the spot where the pursuit was going on and at the same time endeavoured to regain the road which led towards brandon he was some time in finding it and even when actually upon it 
did not feel sure that he was right till he perceived after having gone on for a quarter of a mile a tall finger-post of a peculiar form which he had remarked as he passed before the road was quite solitary although he thought he heard steps running on fast before him and no one did dudley meet with during the whole weary seven miles he had still to walk before he reached the gates of brandon park sad and gloomy were the thoughts which kept him company by the way from that scene of mad violence he reflected upon the fate of the misled men who had fallen or been taken and with still more sorrowful feelings he thought of the future condition of the widow the orphans the parents of the dead and all that were connected with or dependent upon the prisoners but it is with his own fate i have to do and not with his mere meditations and therefore i will conduct him at once past the old barn and lonely farmhouse which marked about half the distance and bring him to the gates of the park the moon was by this time rising but the light of a candle was in the lodge and the small door leading into the park at the side of the greater ones was open dudley passed through and advanced up the avenue towards the house but he had not proceeded two hundred yards when two men started out upon him from behind the trees and seized him by the shoulder mr edward dudley said one i apprehend you in the queen's name here is the warrant upon what charge demanded dudley without making any resistance why it may be murder it may be manslaughter replied the constable that remains to be seen you must come to the lodge for to-night sir for i am ordered to keep you there in safe custody in the little room with the round window at the back End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen it is necessary now to leave dudley in the hands of the constables and to take up the history of another personage in the tale sir arthur adelon spurred on for four miles without drawing a rein and almost without giving a thought to any point in his situation except the effort necessary to escape personal danger for the first two miles he fancied that he heard the sounds of pursuit behind him but gradually as no one appeared and his keenest attention did not confirm the impression which fear had produced he became convinced that he had escaped immediate capture and while he still urged his horse furiously forward he meditated over the perilous future his course was directed along a narrow horse-path across the downs with every turning of which he was well acquainted but which added nearly two miles to the distance he had to go he paid little attention to any external objects but one thing could not escape his eye as he rode over the high grounds towering above the sea it was a dim light at the distance of about a mile from the shore and he knew right well that it was burning on board a small french brig which had brought over the two field pieces the night before the sight suggested to his mind the idea of flight from england but there were many difficult and dangerous points to be considered before such a step could be taken and after a while he somewhat checked his horse's speed and though still proceeding at a quick trot revolved in an intense but confused and rambling manner the circumstances which surrounded him his inclination was certainly to fly but then he remembered that to do so would fix upon him participation in the crimes of that night that he might not be able to return to his country for long years and that the rest of his life might be spent in the pains of exile he recollected too that he had held back at that period of the attack upon the town of barhampton when the magistrates had appeared upon the wall and summoned the multitude to disperse and retire quietly to their homes and he fancied that disguised as his person had been in a large wrapping cloak with a handkerchief tied over the lower part of his face and a hat unlike that which he usually wore he might have escaped without observation on the part of most of the rioters but then again dudley had seen him spoken to him recognized him he was the only one except norris that was fully aware of his presence on the spot and sir arthur believed that he had seen the latter fall dead under the fire of the troops could dudley be silenced all might go well 
but still the baronet hesitated and balanced and remained undecided till the gates of brandon park appeared before him it was necessary to come to some immediate decision and yet he could not make up his mind to decide and at length he determined as most men in a state of doubt are inclined to do to cast the burden upon another i will speak with filmer he thought and upon his advice i will act the gates were immediately opened on his ringing the bell for the tenants of the lodge knowing that he was absent had waited up for his return and riding hard up the avenue sir arthur entered his niece's house a little after eleven o'clock a momentary hesitation crossed him when he was passing the threshold as to whether he should consult with father peter or not but that doubt was immediately put an end to by the first words of the butler who stood behind the servant that opened the door oh sir arthur he said with a very grave face some terrible things have happened i know i know cried sir arthur interrupting him hastily and somewhat surprised to find that the tidings had travelled so quick where is mr filmer i must see him directly call him to me immediately he is in the library sir replied the man and passing on with a quick step sir arthur adelon entered the room where the priest was seated alone father filmer was sitting at a large library table with his head resting on his hand and as he raised his eyes to the baronet's countenance with the light of the large lamp streaming upon his broad forehead there was an expression of intense stern thought upon his face which made sir arthur feel he was in the presence of his master more than of his friend perhaps he closed the door and saw that it was firmly shut and as he was advancing towards the table mr filmer inquired what is the matter sir arthur you are pale haggard and apparently much agitated have you not heard my good father asked the baronet i had understood that the rumour had reached brandon i have heard much replied the priest but what i wish to hear is what is it that has so much affected you my son he continued rising and gazing gravely upon sir arthur's face if you would have comfort consolation and advice from one who is your old and long-tried friend as well as your spiritual guide you must have confidence in him now in that confidence you have been wanting lately you have told me half and i have known the whole you have avoided rather than sought my counsel and i have not forced it upon you although i knew you to be engaged in enterprises dangerous to yourself and others and knew also the inducements which forced you forwards and from which i could have relieved you if you would but have been guided by me the one thing of which i was unaware was that the rash attempt was to be made to-night i see by your face by your dress by your manner that it has been so and now i ask you the result not from any idle curiosity but for the purpose of delivering you from the difficulties which your own want of confidence has brought upon you speak and every word that you say shall be held as sacred as if uttered under the seal of confession the result my best friend replied sir arthur is more disastrous than can be conceived and he went on to give his own version of all that had occurred dwelling particularly upon dudley's appearance amongst the rioters and the words which he had used filmer suffered him to proceed to an end without a single question he did not even embarrass him by a look but having resumed his seat kept his eyes fixed thoughtfully upon the table and his head slightly bent in listening attention and now what am i to do asked sir arthur i will be guided entirely by your advice there is the french brig which has been hired by some of these men through the société démocratique now lying off the coast a boat will carry me on board in half an hour and i shall be safe in france as fugitives accused of mere political offences cannot be claimed would you ruin yourself for ever asked father filmer would you put a brand upon your name which can never be effaced think not of it merely answer me one or two questions are you sure that norris is dead i saw him fall with my own eyes answered the baronet and i think that one of the cannon passed over him for the horses took fright at the firing norris would not betray you i think said mr filmer thoughtfully and then repeated he would not betray you even if he were living i do believe but he has betrayed me to this young dudley already 
answered sir arthur adelon sharply his words clearly showed that he is informed of all that passed six years ago he the son of my greatest enemy has me now entirely in his power it is that which makes it so necessary to fly he saw me spoke to me can swear to my presence there but he you think is the only one said the priest in a tone of inquiry assuredly replied sir arthur i have been at only two of their meetings and at the last i strongly dissuaded them from the attempt and said that i would take no part in it which was the cause of norris's threatening visit here all my other communications have been carried on with him then you are safe said the priest if any one has by chance recognized your person it may easily be said that you were there to dissuade the people from their rash attempt and you can call witnesses to prove that you had done so before but dudley dudley said the baronet almost impatiently he can prove all i will provide for him replied the priest with a marked emphasis and a bitter smile he shall be taken care of but how how cried sir arthur come with me and i will show you answered mr filmer and lighting a taper at the lamp he led the way into the hall sir arthur followed in wonder and doubt and the priest opened the door of the dining-room and went in as soon as sir arthur entered his eyes fell upon the dining-room table which was covered with a white cloth concealing from the eye some large object like the figure of a man mr filmer set down the light he carried on the sideboard where two other wax candles were burning and then with a slow firm step and grave countenance approached the end of the table and threw back the cloth sir arthur had followed him step by step but what was his horror and surprise to see when the covering was removed the cold inanimate features of lord hadley with his forehead and head covered with blood and his clothes likewise stained with gore and dust good heaven he exclaimed how has this happened and how does this bear upon my own fate how it has happened answered mr filmer remains to be proved and shall be proved and how it bears upon your fate i will leave you to divine at least for the present that unhappy young man had a sharp and angry discussion this morning with mr dudley the subject was helen clive whom he who lies there was pursuing with the basest intentions and insulting with familiarities as well as importunities alike repugnant to one of so high a mind the dispute proceeded to very fierce and angry menaces on both parts dudley forgot his usual moderation and the sharp terms he used were overheard by myself and two others at dinner they were cold and repulsive towards each other and after dinner towards eight o'clock mr dudley left the house upon what errand i do not know that unhappy young man followed him inquiring which way the other took and i find that they were seen passing the lodge and going up towards the downs at that time they were in eager conversation their gestures were warm and their tones indicative of much excitement though the words they uttered were not heard somewhat more than two hours ago the boatmen fishermen or smugglers as the case may be brought home that lifeless mass of clay with the vital spark even then quite extinct the account they gave was this that one of their number while watching a french brig lying about a mile from the shore heard high words from the cliff above his head he thought he heard a cry too as if for help and looking up he saw two men at the very edge of the precipice though in the darkness he could but distinguish the bare outline of their forms against the sky there seemed to him to be blows struck and a scuffle between them and the moment after one disappeared for the dark face of the rock prevented his fall from being seen but a loud cry almost a shriek he said and then the sound of a heavy fall and a deadly groan called him to the spot where he found this youth lying weltering in his blood the priest paused for a moment or two while sir arthur adelon approached nearer and bent down his head over the dead body and then mr filmer with a significant look continued mr dudley will have occupation enough there is no other wound added the priest observing that sir arthur was still looking close at the corpse but that occasioned by the fall the skull is fractured 
the right thigh broken, the brain severely injured. Death must have been very speedy, though he was still living when the fisherman found him, but never uttered a word. Now, my son, the consequences of this act are important to you. "'But was it Dudley who killed him?' asked the baronet, with an eager look. "'I cannot think it, and my good, kind friend, I cannot wish to bring his blood upon my head, were it even to spare my own. The events of this night,' he continued, taking the priest's hands in his, and pressing them tight, "'have given me strange feelings, Filmer. I have seen men die, if not in consequence of my act, at least in consequence of acts in which I participated, and I cannot, I will not, even to save my own life, bring a farther weight upon my conscience. For whatever you do in this case, answered Filmer, the church has power to absolve you, and for much more than I intend you should do. This Dudley is an obstinate heretic, who has had the means of light and has refused it and although it is necessary now, from the circumstances of the times, to refrain from exercising that just rigour which in better and more spiritual days was displayed to every impenitent person in his situation, yet, of course, we cannot look upon him with the same feelings, or find ourselves bound to him by the same ties, which would exist between us and a Catholic Christian. Body and soul he is given over to reprobation, and we have no need to go out of our way to shelter him in any degree from the laws of his own heretic land, a land which for centuries has given the true faith up to persecution and injustice of every kind. Let him take his chance. I ask you to do nothing more. The evidence is very strong against him. No other person was seen near this unfortunate young man but a very short time could have elapsed after they were remarked together, apparently in high dispute before this fatal occurrence took place. Other evidence may appear, and he may be proved guilty or innocent, but at all events he must be tried, and the time of that trial may be yet remote. The first cases that will be taken will certainly be those connected with these riots, and the only direct witness against you will be then in jail. "'But how am I to act in this business?' demanded Sir Arthur Adelon. "'As a magistrate,' as the person in whose house both the dead man and the living were staying i shall continually be called upon to share in the different proceedings and my part will be a terribly difficult one to play my friend not in the least answered filmer you must refuse to act as a magistrate even should you be called upon alleging your acquaintance with both parties and your natural partiality for mr dudley on account of an old friendship between his father and yourself as sufficient excuses whatever evidence you give may be highly favourable to the accused person the testimony against him will be strong enough rest assured of that then do you really think him guilty demanded the baronet gazing at the priest with those doubts which a long acquaintance with his character had impressed even upon the mind of a man not very acute nay i do not prejudge the question replied filmer as yet we have not sufficient grounds to go upon all I say is, the case of suspicion is very strong, and what I would advise you to do, under any circumstances, would be to send immediately for your nearest neighbour, Mr. Conway, turn over the case to him, and let him judge whether it be not necessary instantly to issue a warrant for the apprehension of Mr. Dudley, when he returns. It were better that not a moment were lost, for although you have probably ridden fast, it cannot be long ere the person we suspect is here perhaps he may not return at all said sir arthur it is more than probable that on foot and unarmed he has been apprehended as one of the rioters but we can send at all events and ringing the bell sharply he gave the necessary orders but now continued the baronet reverting to the topic of greatest interest in his own mind as soon as the servant had left the room how am i to act in regard to this attack upon barhampton we must see replied the priest should norris be dead or have made his escape you must assume a degree of boldness acknowledge that your views are the same in regard to general principles as those of the unfortunate men implicated but declare openly that you have always opposed any recourse to physical force in the assertion of any political opinions whatever 
and bring forward witnesses to prove that you attempted to dissuade them from all violence refusing to take any part therein that will be easily done and should any one come forward to state that you were present at the attack you can show that you went thither on hearing that it was about to take place in order to constrain them to refrain from executing their intentions by every means in your power but how can i show that demanded sir arthur we will find a way replied filmer but that can be discussed to-morrow i must now go out to console some of my little flock who are suffering from affliction in the meantime you must manage this examination the witnesses are the old man at the lodge your butler the head footman brown and the fishermen who are now waiting in the servants hall as he spoke he moved towards the door sir arthur would fain have detained him a moment to ask farther questions but filmer laid his hand upon his arm saying be firm be firm and left him End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen at the distance of about a quarter of a mile from clive grange was a group of six or seven cottages of neat and comfortable appearance tenanted by labourers on mr clive's own farm they were all respectable hard-working people and as clive himself was not without his prejudices especially upon religious matters he had contrived that most of those whom he employed should be roman catholics as there were not many of that church in the part of the country where he lived some of these men had come from a distance he would not indeed refuse a good workman and a man of high character on account of his being a protestant but he had a natural preference for persons of his own views and all things equal chose them rather than any others this preference was known far and wide and consequently when any of his distant friends wished to recommend an honest man of the romish creed to employment where they were certain to be well treated they wrote to mr clive so that he had rarely any difficulty in suiting himself in one of these cottages at a much later hour than usual a light was burning on the night of which i have been speaking and within over the smouldering embers of a small wood fire sat a tall man of the middle age with a peculiar deep-set blue eye fringed with dark lashes which is very frequently to be found amongst the milesian race his figure was bent and his hands stretched out over the smouldering hearth to gain any little heat that it gave out and as he thus sat his eyes were bent upon the red sparks amongst the white ashes with a grave contemplative gaze he seemed dull and somewhat melancholy and from time to time muttered a few words to himself with the peculiar tone of his countrymen ay he said as something struck him in the half-extinguished fire that one's gone out too if the priest stays much longer they'll all be out one after the other well it's little matter for that we must all go out some time or other and very often when we think we are burning brightest that young lad now i dare say when he went out for his walk never fancied his neck would be broke before he came home again sorrow a bit he got what he deserved anyhow and i'd have done it for him if the master hadn't Hist! that must be the priest's step coming down the hill he's the only man likely to be out so late in this country and going with such a slow step though the lads are having a bit of a shindy to-night they tell me the next moment the latch was lifted the door opened and mr filmer walked in the labourer instantly rose and placed a wooden chair for his pastor by the side of the fire saying good night your reverence it's mighty cold this afternoon i don't find it so answered filmer but i dare say you do sitting all alone here with but a little spark like that i was afraid you would get tired of waiting and go to bed i am much obliged to you for sitting up as i told you oh in course i did as your reverence said answered daniel connor i always obey my priest that's right dan answered mr filmer now i have come to tell you what i want you to do like a good lad anything your reverence says i am quite ready to do replied the irishman i kept the matter quite quiet as you said 
and not a bare word about it passed my lips to any of the servants for i am not going to say anything that can hurt the master for a better never lived than he no dan answered the priest but i'll tell you what you must do you must say a word or two to serve him and filmer fixed his eyes keenly upon the man's face which brightened up in a moment with a very shrewd and merry smile as he replied that i'll do with all my heart your reverence it's but the telling me what to say and i'll say it well then you see dan continued filmer this is likely to be a bad business for mr clive if we do not manage very skilfully he is somewhat obstinate himself and might with difficulty be persuaded to take the line of defence we want and which indeed is necessary to his own safety now the first thing that will take place here is the coroner's inquest ay i suppose so but they shan't get anything out of me there i can answer for it i can be as blind as a mole when i like and as deaf too but you must be somewhat more dan was the priest's reply you see if suspicion fixes to no one and the jury bring in a verdict of wilful murder against some person or persons unknown the magistrates will never leave inquiring into the matter till they fix it upon your poor master what we must do must be to turn the first suspicions upon some one else so as to keep mr clive free of them altogether and then he will be safe enough won't that be something very like murder your reverence asked connor abruptly with a very grave face i never did the like of that and i think it's a sin is it not the sin be upon me answered filmer sternly cannot i absolve you daniel connor for that which i bid you to do are you going to turn heretic too do you doubt that the church has power to absolve you from your sins or that where she points out the course to you the end does not justify the means oh no the blessed saints forbid exclaimed connor eagerly i don't doubt a word of it i am quite sure your reverence is right i was only just asking you like oh if that's all answered mr filmer and you are not beginning to feel scandalous doubts from living so long amongst the number of heretics all about i will answer your question plainly it is not at all like murder nor will there be any sin in it the person who is likely to be suspected will be able easily to clear himself in the end so that he runs no risk of anything but a short imprisonment which may perhaps turn to the good of his soul for i shall not fail to visit him and show him the way to the true light but in the meantime mr clive will be saved from all danger and if you look at the matter as a true son of the church you will see that there is no choice between a believer like mr clive and an obstinate heretic and unbeliever like this other man oh if it is a heretic exclaimed connor with a laugh that quite alters the matter i didn't know he was a heretic you do not suppose i hope replied mr filmer that i would have proposed such a thing if he was not all my children are equally dear to me be they high or low and i would not peril one to save another well your reverence i am quite ready to do whatever you say answered connor and if you just give me a thought of the right way i'll walk along it as straight as a line the case is this then rejoined the priest there was a quarrel between this young lord and a mr dudley which went on more or less through the whole of this day dudley went out about eight o'clock and lord hadley followed him and overtook him and they went on quarrelling by the way very soon after that the young lord met with his death now men will naturally think that mr dudley killed him for no one but you and your master and miss clive saw him after till he was speechless what you must do then is this when you hear the coroner's inquest is sitting you must come up and offer to give evidence and you must tell them exactly where you were standing when the young lord came up to the top of the cliff and then you must say that you saw a man come up to him and a quarrel take place and two or three blows struck and the unhappy lad pitched over the cliff and not a word about miss helen said the man not a word answered filmer keep yourself solely to the fact of having seen a man of gentlemanly appearance oh he is a gentleman every inch of him exclaimed connor no doubt about that your reverence so you can state continued the priest but take care not to enter too much into detail say you saw him but indistinctly that's true enough cried the labourer for it was a darkish night 
and I was low down in the glen, and he high up on the side of the hill, so that I caught but a glimmer of him, as it were. But it was the master notwithstanding, that I am quite sure of, or else the devil in his likeness. But by the blessed saints I do not think it could be the devil either, for he did what any man would have done in his place, and what I should have done in another minute if he hadn't come up, for I would not have stood by to see the young lady ill-treated, no how. Doubtless not, answered the priest, and it would be hard that the life of such a man should be sacrificed for merely defending his own child. Oh, no, that shall never be, answered Connor, if my word can stop it. And so, father, he continued with a shrewd look, I suppose that the best thing I can do is, if I am asked any questions, to say that I didn't rightly see the gentleman that did it, but that he looked like a real gentleman, and may be about the height of this Mr. Dudley. I saw him twice at the farmhouse, and if he is in the room, I can point him out as being about the tallness of the man I saw. And that's not a lie either, for they are much alike, in length at least. Neither one nor the other stands much under six feet. I'd better not swear to him, however. By no means, answered the priest, keep to mere general facts that can but cause suspicion. I wish not to injure the young man, but merely to turn suspicion upon him, rather than Mr. Clive, and by so doing to give even Mr. Dudley himself a sort of involuntary penance, which may soften an obdurate heart towards the church which his father's foolishly abandoned, and leave him one more chance of salvation if he chooses to accept of it. It is a hard thing, Daniel Connor, to remain for many thousands of years in the flames of purgatory, where every moment is marked and prolonged by torture indescribable, instead of entering into eternal beatitude, where all sense of time is lost in inexpressible joy from everlasting to everlasting. But it is a still harder thing to be doomed in hell to eternal punishment, where the whole wrath and indignation of God is poured out upon the head of the unrepenting and the obstinate for ever and ever. "'It is mighty hard indeed,' answered the labourer, making the sign of the cross. "'The Blessed Virgin keep us all from such luck as that.' "'It is from that I wish to save him,' rejoined Mr. Filmer. "'But his heart must first be humbled, for you know very well, Daniel, that pride is a source of unbelief in the minds of all these heretics they judge their own opinions to be far better than the dogmas of the church the decisions of councils or the exposition of the fathers and by the same sin which caused the fall of the angels they have also fallen from the faith let no true son of the church follow their bad example but knowing that all things are a matter of faith and that the church is the interpreter mentioned in scripture submit their human and fallible reason implicitly to that high and holy authority which is vested in the successor of the apostle and the councils of the church where they will only find the only infallible guide oh but i'll do that certainly replied connor eagerly and yet a shade of doubt seemed to hang upon him for he added the moment after but you know your reverence that when they swear me they will make me swear to tell the whole truth and if i do not say that i know it was mr clive it will be false swearing heed not that answered filmer with a frown have i not told you that i will absolve you and do absolve you besides how can you swear to that which you only believe but do not exactly know you told me this evening up at the hall that you did not see your master's face when he struck the blow ah but i saw his face well enough when he was going up replied the labourer that does not prove that he was the same who did the deed said filmer another might have suddenly come there without your perceiving how he was mighty like the master anyhow said the man in a low tone but i'll say just what your reverence bids me do so answered filmer turning to leave the cottage the church speaks by my voice and accursed be all who disobey her the stern earnestness with which he spoke the undoubting confidence which his words and looks displayed in his power as a priest of that church which pretends to hold the ultimate fate of all beings in its hands his own apparent faith in that vast and blasphemous pretension had their full effect upon his auditor who though a good man a shrewd man and not altogether an unenlightened man 
had sucked in such doctrines with his mother's milk so that they became as it were a part of his very nature to be sure i will obey said connor it is no sin of mine if any harm comes of it that's the priest's affair anyhow and he retired to his bed End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the convict by g p r james the slip of ox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen father peter turned away to the right and walked on for he had yet work to do and a somewhat different part to play before the night was done the versatility of the genius of the roman church is one of its most dangerous qualities the principle that the end justifies the means makes it seem right to those who hold such a doctrine to be all things to all men in a very different sense from that of the apostle five minutes brought mr filmer to the door of the grange and he looked over that side of the house for a light but in vain one of the large dogs came and fawned upon him and all the rest was silent for it is wonderful how soon and easily he accustomed all creatures to his influence his slow quiet yet firm footfall was known amongst those animals as well as their masters or edgar adelon's and at two or three hundred yards they had recognized it after a moment's consideration filmer rang the bell gently and the next instant clive himself appeared with a light in his hand he was fully dressed and his face was grave and composed ah father he said as soon as he perceived who his visitor was this is kind of you come in helen has not gone to bed yet i am glad to hear it my son replied filmer for i want to speak a few words with you both thus saying he walked on before mr clive into the room where helen clive usually sat he found her with her eyes no longer tearful but red with weeping and seating himself with a kindly manner beside her he said grieve not my dear child whatever has happened there is consolation for all who believe but you know not yet father what has happened answered helen with a glance at her father you will know soon however i do know what has happened helen said the priest though not all the particulars and i have come down at once to give you comfort and advice tell me my son how did this sad event occur it is soon rumoured it was seen then observed clive in a gloomy tone i told you helen that concealment was hopeless though we thought no eye saw it but our own and that of him who saw all and would judge the provocation as well as the punishment concealment is not hopeless my son replied filmer if concealment should be needful as i fear it is only one person saw you and he came at once to tell me and bring me down to comfort you for he is a faithful child of our holy mother the church and will betray no man but tell me all clive am i not your friend as well as your pastor tell him helen tell the good father said clive seating himself at the table and leaning his head upon his hand i have no heart to speak of it the priest turned his eyes to helen who immediately took up the tale which her father was unwilling to tell i believe i am myself to blame she said in a low sweet tone though god knows i thought not of what would follow when i went out but i must tell you why i did so my father and i have been talking all the evening of the wild and troubled state of the country and of what was likely to take place at barhampton to-night it has taken place replied father filmer the magistrates were prepared for the rioters the troops have been in amongst the people and many a precious life has been lost it was what we feared continued helen sadly alas that men will do such wild and lawless things but about that very tumult my father was anxious and uneasy and towards half-past six he went out to see if he could meet my uncle norris as he went and at all events to look out from the top of the downs towards barhampton he promised me that he would on no account go farther than the old wall and that he would be back in half an hour but more than an hour passed and i grew frightened till at last i sent up daniel connor to see if he could find my father he seemed long though perhaps he was not 
and I then resolved to go myself. I had no fear at all, for I had never heard of Lord Hadley being out at night, and I thought he would be at the dinner-table, and I quite safe, safer indeed than in the day. I was only anxious for my father, and for him I was very anxious. However, I walked on fast, and soon came to the downs, but I could see no one, and taking the slanting path up the slope, I came just to the edge of the cliff, and looked out over the sea to Barhampton Head. There was nothing to be seen there, and only a light in a ship at sea. That made me more frightened than ever, for I had felt sure that I should find my father there, and thinking that he might have sat down somewhere to wait, I called him aloud, to beg he would come. There was no answer, but I heard a step coming up the path which runs between the two slopes, and then goes down over the lower broken part of the cliff to the seashore. And feeling sure that it was either my father, or Connor, or one of the boatmen, who would not have hurt me for the world, I was just turning to go down that way when Lord Hadley sprang up the bank and caught hold of me by the hand. I besought him to let me go, and then I was very frightened indeed, so that I hardly knew, or no, what I said or did. All I am sure of is that he tried to persuade me to go away with him to France, and he told me there was a ship for that country out there at sea, and its boat with the boatman down upon the shore, for he had spoken to them in the morning. He said a great deal that I forget, telling me that he would marry me as soon as we arrived in France, but I was very angry, too angry indeed, and what I said in reply seemed to make him quite furious, for he swore that I should go with a terrible oath. I tried to get away, but he kept hold of my hand and threw his other arm round me, and was dragging me away down the path towards the seashore, when suddenly my father came up and struck him. I had not been able to resist much on account of my broken arm, but the moment my father came up, he let me go, and returned the blow he had received. We were then close upon the edge of the cliff, and there is, if you recollect, a low railing where the path begins to descend. My father struck him again and again, and at last he fell back against the railing, which broke, I think, under his weight, and, oh, father, I saw him fall headlong over the cliff. I thought I should have died at that moment, and before I recovered myself, my father had taken me by the hand and was leading me away. When we had got a hundred yards or two, I stopped, and asked if it would not be better to go or send down to the seashore to see if some help could not be rendered to him. My father said he had heard the boatmen come to assist him, and that was enough. Clive had covered his eyes with his hand while Helen spoke, but at her last words he looked up, saying in a stern tone, "'Quite enough. He well deserved what he has met with. I did not intend it, it is true, but whether he be dead or living, he has only had the chastisement he merited. I had heard but an hour or two before all his base conduct to this dear child. I had heard that he had outraged, insulted, persecuted her, and although I had promised Norris not to kill him, yet I had resolved the first time I met with him to flay him alive with my horsewhip. I found him again insulting her, and can any man say I did wrong to punish the base villain on the spot? I regret it not. I would do it again, be the consequences what they may. And so I will tell judge and jury, whenever I am called upon to speak. I trust that may never be, my son, replied the priest, looking at him with an expression of melancholy interest, and I doubt not at all that, if you follow the advice which I will give you, suspicion will never even attach to you. "'I shall be very happy, father, to hear your advice,' answered Clive. "'But I have no great fears of any evil consequences. "'People cannot blame me for striking a man who was insulting and seeking to wrong my child. "'I did but defend my own blood and her honour, and there is no crime in that.' "'People often make a crime when there is none, Clive,' answered Mr. Filmer. "'This young man is dead.' and you must recollect that he was a peer of England. "'That makes no difference,' exclaimed Clive. "'Thank God we do not live in a land where the peer can do wrong any more than the peasant. "'I am sorry he is dead, for I did not intend to kill him. "'But he well deserved his death, and his station makes no difference.' "'None in the eye of the law,' 
replied Mr. Filmer gravely, but it may make much in the ear of a jury. I know these things well, Clive, and depend upon it that if this matter should come before a court of justice at the present time, especially when such wild acts have been committed by the people, you are lost. In the first place, you cannot prove the very defence you make. Why, my child was there and saw it all, cried Clive, interrupting him. "'Her evidence would go for very little,' answered the priest, "'and as I know you would not deny having done it, "'your own candour would ruin you. "'The best view that a jury would take of your case, "'even supposing them not to be worked up by the rank of the dead man, "'could only produce a verdict of manslaughter, "'which would send you for life to a penal colony, "'to labour like a slave, perhaps in chains.' "'Clive started and gazed anxiously in his face,' as if that view of the case were new to him. "'Better die than that,' he said. "'Better die than that.' "'Assuredly,' replied Mr. Filmer. "'But why should you run the risk of either? "'I tell you, if you will follow my advice, "'you shall pass without suspicion.' But Clive waved his hand almost impatiently, saying, "'Impossible, father, impossible. "'I am not a man who can set a guard upon his lips.' and I should say things from time to time which would soon lead men to see and know who it was that did it. I could not converse with any of my neighbours here without betraying myself. "'Then you must go away for a time,' answered Filmer. "'That was the very advice I was going to give you. If you act with decision and leave the country for a short time, I will be answerable for your remaining free from even a doubt.' "'The very way to bring doubt upon myself,' "'answered Clive with a short, bitter laugh. "'Would not every one ask why Clive ran away?' "'The answer would then be simple,' said the priest, "'namely, that he went, probably, "'because he had engaged with his brother-in-law Norris "'in these rash schemes against the government, "'which have been so signally frustrated this night at Barhampton.' "'One crime instead of another,' answered Clive gloomily, "'bending down his brow upon his hands again.' "'With this difference,' continued Mr. Filmer, "'that the one will be soon and easily pardoned, the other never. "'That for the one you cannot be pursued into another land, "'that for the other you would be pursued and taken. "'That the one brings no disgrace upon your name, "'that the other blasts you as a felon, "'leaves a stain upon your child, "'deprives her of a parent, ruins her happiness for ever.' "'Oh, fly, father, fly!' cried Helen. "'Save yourself from such a horrible fate!' "'What, and leave you here unprotected?' exclaimed Clive. "'Oh, no, let me go with you,' cried Helen. "'Of course,' said the priest. "'You cannot, and you must not go alone. "'Take Helen with you, and be sure that her devotion towards you "'will but increase and strengthen that strong affection "'which she has inspired in one worthy of her.' and of whom she is worthy. I have promised you, Clive, or rather I should say I have assured you, that your daughter shall be the wife of him she loves, I, with his father's full consent. If you follow my advice, it shall be so. But do not suppose that Sir Arthur would ever suffer his son to marry the daughter of a convict. As it is, he knows that your blood is as good as his own, and that the only real difference is in fortune but with a tainted name the case would be very different. There would be an insurmountable bar against their union, and you would make her whole life wretched, as well as cast away your own happiness for ever. "'But how can I fly?' asked Clive. "'The whole thing will be known to-morrow, and ere I reached London I should be pursued and taken.' "'There is a shorter way than that,' answered Filmer, "'and one that cannot fail.' "'The French ship!' cried Helen, with a look of joy. "'Even so,' rejoined the priest, "'she will sail in a few hours. "'You have nothing to do but send down what things you need as fast as possible. "'Get one of the boats to row you out, embark, and you are safe. "'I will give you letters to a friend in Brittany, "'who will show you all kindness, "'and you can remain there at peace till I tell you you may safely return.' "'Clive paused and seemed to hesitate for a moment or two. But Helen gazed imploringly in his face, and at length he threw his arms around her, saying, "'I will go, my child. I have no right to make you wretched also. Were it for myself alone, nothing should make me run away. 
but now nothing must induce me to sacrifice you go helen get ready quickly perhaps they may think that i have had some share in this tumult and suspicion pass away in that manner undoubtedly they will rejoined mr filmer and i will take care to give suspicion that direction be quick helen but do you not need some one to aid you i will get the girl margaret said helen clive for i am very helpless and closing the door she departed what shall i do with the farm inquired clive as soon as she was gone i fear everything will go to ruin not so not so answered mr filmer cheerfully i will see that it is well attended to and though perhaps something may go wrong against which nothing but the owner's eye can secure yet nothing like ruin shall take place and now hasten away clive and make your own preparations no time is to be lost for if the people on board the ship learn that the attack upon barhampton has failed they may perhaps put to sea sooner than the hour they had appointed i will write the letter while you are getting ready and i will go down with you to the beach and see you off about three-quarters of an hour passed in some hurry and confusion ere clive and his daughter were prepared to set out the priest's letter was written and sealed a man was called up to wheel some boxes and trunks down to the shore and various orders and directions were given for the management of the farm during clive's absence the servant seemed astonished but asked no questions and mr filmer skilfully let drop some words which when remembered at an after period might connect the flight of mr clive with the mad attempt upon the town of barhampton when all was completed they set forth on foot passing through the narrow lanes in the neighbourhood of the house till they reached and crossed the high road and then following one of the little dells through the downs descended by a somewhat rugged path to the seaside some of the boatmen were already up preparing to put to sea and as clive had often been a friend to all of them no difficulty was made in fulfilling his desire the sea was as calm as a small lake and though the water was too low to launch one of their large boats easily yet a small one was pushed over the sands and helen and her father stood beside it ready to embark when a quick step running over the beach was heard and mr filmer exclaimed quick quick into the boat and put off that is edgar's foot said helen hanging back oh let me wait and bid him adieu i know it is edgar's foot the ear of love is quick said mr filmer i did not recognize it and in another moment edgar adelon stood beside them i have been to the house he said and they told me where to seek you we are forced to go away for a time by some unpleasant circumstances mr adelon said clive gravely i know i know it all answered edgar quickly i watched the whole attack from the hill it was a strange ghastly sight and i will not stop you mr clive for it would be ruin to stay but let me speak one word to dear helen but one word and i will not keep you the father made no opposition he knew what it was to love well and he would not withhold the small drop of consolation from the bitter cup of parting edgar drew the fair girl a few steps aside and they spoke together earnestly for a few minutes he then pressed her hand affectionately in his and each repeated for ever then leading her back towards the boat against the sides of which the water was now rising he shook clive's hand warmly saying god bless and protect you let me put her in the boat and before any one could answer he had lifted helen tenderly in his arms walked with her into the shallow water and placed her in the little bark clive followed after another word or two with mr filmer the boatman pushed off and the prow went glittering through the waves edgar adelon stood and gazed till mr filmer touched him on the arm saying come my son and then with a deep sigh the young man followed him towards the cliffs i must go back to the grange for my horse said edgar as the priest was turning along the high road towards brandon better send for it said mr filmer your father has returned and may inquire for you it is strange said edgar following him i could have sworn i saw his tall bay hunter among the people at barhampton you might well be mistaken answered mr filmer but whatever you saw edgar take my advice and say to no one that you saw anything no not to eda edgar did not reply and the rest of their walk passed in silence till they reached the gates of the park they were open 
and a man was standing at the lodge door with whom the priest paused to speak for an instant while edgar at his request walked on mr filmer overtook the young man ere he had gone a hundred yards and as they approached the house he said you had better go straight to your room and to bed edgar unpleasant things have happened eda has retired your father has another magistrate with him and neither your presence nor mine will be agreeable to my own room certainly answered edgar adelon but not to bed nor to sleep father i have need of thought more than rest and when the door was opened he passed straight through the hall taking a light from the servant and mounting the stairs towards his own room End of chapter nineteen